spoon in your hot, oh, hot mic. All right, well, well, thank you for inviting us to uh, present our qualifications for your transportation engineering and uh, services contract. I um, want to start off just by uh, pointing out that Moffitt Nichols brought you a team that we believe is your end-to-end uh, -end transportation uh, management solutions, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through our present <coughs> excuse me, presentation. Um, so why select the Moffitt Nichols team? Well, we, we're bringing you a knowledgeable project manager, um, and we've uh, uh, talked about that a little bit more as well. Um, we also bring to you a team that understands how to navigate uh, VDOT requirements for locally administered projects and funding. Um, we can be your advocate for your transportation needs, and uh, we have a qualified team to back, back us up to help make sure we can, we can bring those projects to fruition. A little bit about Moffitt and Nickel. Um, main things I want to point out is we have been in business for over 70 years. We're a family-owned company, third-generation owner, uh, Eric Nickel. Um, we're a top uh, engineering news record, top 100 design firm. Um, we've done, in Virginia, we've done over 400 projects for locally administered um, um, government agencies uh, in the last 20 years. We've been in, we've been in uh, Virginia for just a little over 20 years. And then we, we, we have a high repeat business. We, we end up uh, um, meeting our clients' needs, and that's shown in our 90% our uh, um, um, client satisfaction rate and return business. A little bit about the Moffitt and Nickel team. Uh, we've added uh, some, some consultants to our team to round out the transportation uh, components that we expect under this contract. Uh, we have Rice Associates on board for surveying support and utility engineering, uh, Schnabel Engineering for geotechnical engineering. Both of those firms we've worked with on over 30 transportation projects in the last 15 years. Uh, LPDA will help us with landscaping and, and um, context sensitive design. Uh, EPR is a traffic engineering company that brings a lot of innovative solutions, uh, particularly with, with um, traffic safety and hotspot locations. Uh, KDR is on board to help us with any real estate right away acquisition services. And then CEPI is another uh, local firm that will, will help with any construction inspection. All these firms understand the uh, requirements of, of working on locally administered projects, uh, particularly with VDOT and the funding uh, restrictions that come with them. Um, the Moffitt Nickel team, the majority of our <coughs> firms are located about 30 miles away from town of Blackstone as the crow flies. Um, our project manager, Sam Hayes, actually is a, a um, longtime Dinwiddie, lifetime Dinwiddie resident, uh, lives uh, about 15 minutes away. So very close proximity uh, to be able to help conserve your needs. Um, real quickly, I'll introduce uh, Sam, and then he'll take you through the rest of the team. Uh, Sam, as I mentioned, is, is a lifetime Dinwiddie resident. He has uh, um, joined us about a year ago after uh, retiring from VDOT, 25-year career, where he worked mostly in the Richmond district of VDOT, um, handling location design type projects, as well as uh, administering the project management uh, group there. Um, so with that, Sam, I'll let you take it over. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Again, my name is uh, Sam Hayes. I'm uh, not used to flying the podium here. It reminds me of being in church. I'm a lay leader in church in, in McKinney. Um, as Eric mentioned, we have a lot of different folks on our team that cover uh, areas such as surveying, roadway design, hydraulic design, um, environmental right-of-way, those kinds of things. We also have a number of, of other services, of which like Bill Mechnick is here today. Bill Mechnick is with LPDA. Um, he's going to be helping us with uh, historic design, historic district design and context sensitive issues kind of to re may pertain to the historic district here of downtown, as well as some funding opportunities for you all beyond uh, what I can bring to bear with uh, transportation. As Eric said, I'm, I'm a lifelong resident of the area. I'm very familiar with the town of Blackstone. I think uh, my living memory of ba Blackstone goes back to uh, dropping my grandmother on and off the train station over here, going to Roanoke. So you think about how long ago that was, right? But um, back in 1970, I started elementary school here, and I've been involved with the town ever since. I'm familiar, you know, not only with uh, trains leaving in the 70s, but, you know, the first thing I remember that affected Blackstone was a 460 bypass being built in, in the mid-1970s. That changed the traffic patterns through here greatly. Uh, a lot of the through traffic that used to come through town no longer goes through town because it's going along 460 bypass. I remember uh, when I got off active duty military service and came back home, 
um, the Food Lion Plaza and the Walmart Plaza were just opening up. And I saw a lot of the businesses transform from downtown, you know, a mile or so to the uh, plaza south of here. And I saw how the traffic patterns have changed too. Mm -hmm. South Main Street has gone from being relatively sleepy when I was in school to carrying about 12,000 cars a day in recent counts between 8th Street and down to uh, Route 46. Um, I do appreciate uh, the importance of local government as well. Um, you know, everybody knows who the president is. Everybody knows who the government, governor now is. Most people probably know who their delegate is, but they don't know how to get a hold of them. But I bet you that everybody knows your phone number and they know how to get a hold of you, right? The local, local government is very important in the sense that it's probably the most responsive to the citizens' needs. And citizens today are more uh, clamoring than ever for uh, uh, their ability to have their services provided. Transportation is one of the major services that a local government provides, such as Blackstone, and I appreciate that issue that everything is local. Um, I'm on the Dinwiddie County Planning Commission, so next door uh, in Dinwiddie, I've been uh, on the Planning Commission for about 14 years now. I'm in my fourth term, and I really understand local government from that perspective as well. I'm not elected, I'm appointed, but I, I do appreciate that. Probably the biggest thing that that uh, service has provided me, though, is how land use planning and transportation relate to one another. This yin and yang, they relate back and forth. Transportation decisions drive land use decisions and vice versa. And those are very important and that's something I really appreciate from my experience. Like I said, I'm on just on the other side of Fort Pickett from you all. I was telling these guys here this morning, uh, all I can remember growing up is gunfire. I hear gunfire every day. You, you guys hear that too, right? So if you're around here, you know what that means. And I live in the Darvels community uh, on the other side of, of uh, Fort Pickett. As Eric mentioned earlier, I do have an in-depth understanding of VDOT. I've worked for VDOT for 25 years in a series of progressively uh, higher management positions, all of which uh, led me to be able to help the town of Blackstone over the years. So I have a really good understanding of, of that. Um, forgive me. So my experience with VDOT Richmond District started in the early 90s with uh, being the district location and design engineer. I oversaw um, hydraulic design, roadway design, and surveying. Uh, one of the things that I remember particularly early on in my career, um, I helped out with the design and construction of Nottaway Avenue and Northwest Avenue, those projects. Um, one of the first things I worked with um, was a urban, we used to have a small town urban study for each of our local uh, towns. And the first thing I remember that there was the Main Street issues that first cropped up then for me. And um, I mean, how many of you had your mirrors hit on Main Street? I haven't, but a lot of I my have. friends have. I have. And so I knew, <laughs> yes, I knew, I knew going into that what some of the concerns were, you know, truck traffic and that sort of thing in a, in a vibrant downtown district. So one of the things I helped um, uh, Phillips' predecessor, Larry Palmer, with was what, you know, I call the Brown Street Bypass. That second image there is uh, the intersection of Dinwiddie, Brown, and Main Street. I helped the town with that. I helped negotiate with uh, Brothers Pizza there, some impacts we had there. So I'm very familiar with those kinds of concerns. Um, later on, I was the district project development engineer. I oversaw not only location and design, but right away, environmental, local programs, project management. But I think most significantly for you all, I oversaw the funding, a lot of the funding issues for the district. So I, I managed the interstate program, the primary program. But one of the th interesting things is I worked with the urban program for Town of Blackstone. And what that meant was for many, many years, we had an urban engineer who reported to me, would come out to the town and tell you guys how much money you had to spend. And you guys would prioritize those projects based on the funding, and then typically VDOT would administer them. But today, that's changed completely. The town no longer gets that kind of money from VDOT. You have to compete for it. Just like we're here competing for your business, you have to compete for that funding. And I think you'll see that we have the right team and the right expertise in place to put all those pieces together and help you get that funding. Um, one of the projects I worked on more recently in that role was the Amelia Street Bridge Replacement. So hopefully you won't have to uh, have any bridge maintenance anytime soon. That's a brand new bridge over Norfolk Southern. Um, I also helped the town in recent years with some of the earlier South Main Street projects. That fourth photo there is taken right in front of Clay's Nursery uh, going down to 46. 
And then um, another uh, aspect of helping with land development issues was some of the traffic studies involved with fast <coughs> I know that last picture is hard to see, but that's going east back toward home for me, and that's the main entrance at Fort Pickett and the FAST-C construction sign there. But FAST-C, of course, is a big thing that's going on right now, probably the biggest issue with uh, Fort Pickett since uh, BRAC back in 1996. So um, some other VDOT management experience that I've had that I think will help is that in the last two years before I retired, I oversaw what was called the VDOT STARS program. That stands for Strategically Targeted Affordable Roadway Solutions. You don't need to remember that, but what's important to remember is that program identified a locality's congestion and safety critical areas. We call them hot spots. And we take those hot spots and we transform them into corridor studies that develop improvements that are competitive to smart scale. The performance measure I had with, that was placed on me was at least 50% of my projects had to be competitive for smart scale. But we beat that. We had a 70% success rate. So 70% of the studies that we had resulted in competitive smart scale scores. One of our team members who's not here today, uh, EPR, was one of my subconsultants during that time. And he brings a lot to the table. I want to give you an example of some of his efforts that I think will support uh, the town here in a minute. <coughs> One of the things that's a lot different today also is that, again, when I first started working with the town, I would come here and meet with officials, and then we would administer the projects at VDOT. Well, today it's almost the exact opposite. The projects are administered through the town. And that's a trend that's, that's gone across the entire Commonwealth. It's not unique to the town of Blackstone. And during that time, as that trend has occurred, I don't know whether you recognize, knew this or not, but at last count at VDOT, two-thirds of the projects in terms of number are managed by localities. I recognized that trend as it was occurring, and I created the first district local administered project team back in 2005 to cover my district, of which Blackstone outlined there was one of eight cities and towns that I used to work with. So I created that town with knowing that we need, I created that uh, team rather to help the towns, knowing that how important locally administered program is and knowing how important it is to help localities. And more importantly, I think I, rem I still have excellent rapport with a lot of my colleagues to help, you know, get some things done. Um, some of you I know know Diana Bryant. She lives here in Nottaway County. I've been knowing her since I went to high school with her. I know all the other folks there, have a good rapport with them, and, and it can be, a, again, a truly a good advocate for you all and, and as far as VDOT is concerned. <coughs> I think one of the biggest things we bring to the table here is our significant experience with locality funding opportunities. I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time talking about transportation related. Bill Mechnick, who's here from uh, LPDA, not only has had experience with transportation funds, but other types of funds that kind of go toward the historic district uh, context sensitive design. It goes toward um, community focus, a quality of life, and really a visioning for, for that quality of life. Um, you'll see that, that slide, that, what's on that slide there, you can see it better hopefully in your package, is a transportation alternative program uh, eligibility worksheet. That used to be called enhancement program. Uh, it's now called the TAP program. Uh, that eligibility piece there, I just wanted to say I'm very familiar with that in the context of uh, being able to know what's eligible, what is ineligible. Uh, for instance, if we were doing a trail project, uh, that's ineligible for TAP funding, but the actual design and construction would be, in fact, um, a qualifier for funding. I've scored TAP projects. I have um, worked with localities in the past on TAP projects. Um, I did that with the Virginia Capitol Trail as an example. I've worked with the Secretary of Transportation, Commonwealth Transportation Board members. Um, so I'm very familiar with, with some of the things that need to go on behind the scenes. A lot of moving parts and pieces that go on behind the scenes. I know how to help make that happen. I know about the revenue sharing program. I call this a force multiplier. You can sort of double your money on that. The locality puts up half and VDOT will match the other half. You guys are made of money, right? You got a lot of money sitting around. You can match every dollar you can put up. We can, VDOT will put another dollar, right? Okay. Well, part of my experience also is in help how a locality can come up with their half because it doesn't necessarily have to come from the town's own coffers. It can come from proffers, from development. It can come from uh, working with private landowners. It can come from private businesses. How many of you guys uh, go down 460 uh, to Petersburg often? Anybody do that? 
All right, are y'all familiar down near Sutherland where Tyndall Concrete is? There's a signal there that's it's, it's interconnected with the railroad. Perfect example of the experience that I can bring to you with revenue sharing. I work with Dinwiddie County you know, at VDOT and also as a planning commissioner, but Tyndall Concrete recognized that as a safety issue for their trucks being caught when that light turns red and the train's coming. So 10 years ago, with a project that cost a lot of money then, half a million dollars, to interconnect that traffic signal with the Norfolk Southern signals, that was a revenue sharing project for Dinwiddie County that sponsored the, pro sponsored the project. But the money came from Tyndall Concrete. So it's again a public-private relationship to help make that happen. And that's, a, that's some experience I have in being able to provide some uh, expertise in maybe some areas you wouldn't ordinarily think about with revenue sharing. I'm also familiar with at VDOT what's called the Highway Safety Improvement Program or the HSIP program. Uh, this is for safety money. Remember I said earlier we've got folks on our team that are really good at identifying safety hotspots. I read recently in the Courier Record, uh, I've been getting that for all my life, um, I was on the front page once in the 70s, a long time ago, but I've been getting that paper and I saw, you know, talking about um, a traffic signal needed at uh, 10th and Main. You know, that's the kind of study we can provide and give you expertise on, on what's needed there and what, you know, what's the best solution. But the HSIP program as an example, uh, one of the things that I could see readily that may affect, that may benefit uh, Blackstone would be tying all the signals together and down Main Street, tying them together in such a way to have an adaptive signal system. That's the kind of project that could be covered under the HSIP program. Moffat and Nickel has a lot of experience with large grants, um, some acronyms here uh, like Tiger Grants and Infra Grants and things called TIFIA loans. I don't want to bore you with all that jargon, but the, the, the gist of it is when you have a large uh, change, a large uh, entity coming in like FASC, that may be an opportunity for some of these federal grants to apply for them, and we have the expertise to put that kind of information together and be competitive with a large grant like that. But as I said earlier, no, there's no longer an urban program anymore, so really the big gorilla in the room is competing for state of good repair and smart scale funding. State of good repair relates to maintenance. As Philip knows, the VDOT gives uh, a quarterly maintenance payment to uh, the town each, uh, each quarter, and that's primarily for pavement. You know, I hope you don't need any, any maintenance on that bridge, it's brand new, right? Shouldn't need any maintenance on that until what, 2080, we'll say? Uh, let's hope, 2060 maybe? Beyond my lifetime, anyway. So, pavement may be the bigger issue there with state of good repair. The eligibility for that I'm very familiar with and can help out uh, with getting um, uh, competitive with state of good repair. But I think what most people are interested in is improvements. How can we improve our existing transportation infrastructure? And the way we do that today is through smart scale. Like I said before, just like we're competing for your business, you have to compete and we want to compete with you to be able to get some good smart scale applications in. Okay, how does Blackstone affected by smart scale? Blackstone there, the big gold star in Nottaway County, right next to Dinwiddie County, is in the blue. And the blue is like most of the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's in what in smart scale is referenced as Category D. And what that means is that there are four different areas in Virginia where the factors that you score a project for smart scale differ. You know, in Hampton Roads in Northern Virginia, it's all about congestion, and that's what that color red reflects. But in the blue area, such as Blackstone, there are two, part, there are two factors to that score that really can make or break you. And it's just like on the slide says, safety and economic development. The two together represent two-thirds of the score that are be competitive for smart scale. And I want to give you some examples on how I think, how that, I think we can help there. Okay. Think about that score for a second. It's like back and being in grade school again and thinking about a, fr a fraction, numerator over denominator. Your score is your benefit over the cost, uh, over your cost. The benefit is the factors. And I said earlier, the, the majority of the factors are safety and economic development. The cost is what you're asking for. In other words, if you're asking for a $3 million project, you may want to become more competitive by asking for less than $3 million. And I know you don't have that money in your pocket like we talked about earlier. So maybe you cobble together some money through HSIP or revenue sharing or through a proffer or working with the PDC or any number of things there that can generate that cost or reduce that cost rather. So to increase that score, you either need to improve the benefit or, as I said, reduce the funding request. 
Another ex example of how you can get a better score is to have a game plan. Look at this as a program management approach. In other words, if your goal is to widen, say, South Main Street with new lanes and new sidewalks and so forth, maybe one way to look at this is not go for the whole thing at one time, but to do so in an incremental way that will eventually get you there. But have a plan that you can keep in progress. One of the things I have here to kind of talk about that, I've got a copy of your smart scale application that, that covers a portion of South Main Street. And one of the things I think we can bring to the team is, you guys already put a lot of hard work into this. We've got some strengths that can help grow this and build upon the hard work you've already done. So let me give you a for instance. This project scored number 59 out of 72 in the district last time around. It scored number 250 out of 436 statewide. It had a smart scale score, thinking about that benefit over cost, it had a smart scale score of 1.56. I took liberty to look at the projects that did in fact get funded, and in this particular round, most of those scores were around four and a half, or roughly three times the score on this project. So how do you get from one and a half to four and a half? The big thing is to look after the safety and economic development. The state, we have people on our team that can help identify those safety hotspots. I, I mentioned that earlier. Economic development. I noticed the economic development activities that were listed here were the ones adjacent to the project along South Main Street. But the smart scale rules that are in effect that, that will go into uh, the next round that starts in about a month allow you to have activities up to a three mile radius around the project. So within a three mile radius, there's a lot of other activities that we can help work together and identify to improve that score. And as I said earlier, I think we can develop an approach that will help have a plan to be able to get this and perhaps another way to skin the cat so to speak is to look at it perhaps incrementally. And so to give you an example of that, I was just looking at the South Main Street corridor here. Uh, your application was, was from 10th to Fair, but I like, I, I've always looked at this corridor as really from 8th Street down to right 46. As you guys know, 8th Street takes you back to Pickett, that's the main, main entrance to Pickett. 46 takes you back to the reservoir and so forth or out to Cambridge. But, you know, there's this Food Lion Plaza, there's the Walmart Plaza, you've got Clay's and a few other places along the way, then you get into a residential area, you got the one signal at Walmart, you got the one signal at 8th Street. You got a lot going on there that we can look at from and take different approaches to it. So, just to give an example of, of knowing this is a, a, an ongoing uh, improvement you're looking at, again, I hope I'm leaving you with the with the impression that there's a lot of pieces here that we're familiar with that we can help you with that, that together can help strengthen and build a better smart scale application. I mentioned uh, EPR earlier on our team. That I've worked with them before doing uh, incremental improvements. Um, I asked them to, to, to give me a card or they had looked at recently. Remember I was talking about the STARS program and other funding programs. They had done a, a study in Bedford County um, on a corridor that's very similar to, to South Main Street. I want you, you I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I want you to look at it because it, it gives you a kind of a buffet of things that can be looked at incrementally to make those improvements. So say in the short term, in this case, they looked at turn lane extensions and flashing signal warning lights ahead signs. As you went to the midterm, you looked at maybe coordinating traffic signals and perhaps adding additional lanes near intersections, and then ultimately, widening the whole corridor. So again, it's a, a programmatic approach to, to how to do this. That's just another way to, to skin the cat, so to speak. So with that in mind, um, I've given you a lot of the pieces of the transportation funding. I'd like to ask Bill Megnick to come up and talk a little bit more about uh, not only his side of transportation funding, but historic district context sensitive design and community focus and quality of life. Bill? Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, I just noticed that, first of all, it says I have 46 years of experience. I'm about that old. The firm has been around for 46 years, um, as, as long as I have. It started in 1971. Um, I just wanted to give you a brief background of why we're on the team and what we have to offer in terms of experience and services and how we integrate into the team. Uh, our firm, as I mentioned, Land Planning and Design specializes in community-type projects. Um, and most of those projects are in downtown environments and small towns all across Virginia. That's really our specialty. A lot of the projects are, are funded by uh, various sources that uh, require local 
uh, VDOT and the federal uh, regulatory contacts in terms of requirements uh, that uh, need to be met, both in design as well as bidding and construction um, as well. Uh, recently, we've completed uh, quite a few downtown revitalization projects, streetscape projects, and trail type projects that are funded with, with uh, various funding sources, some that that, uh, that Sam mentioned, some others that I'll, that I'll cover uh, next. But as I mentioned, most of those are in downtown uh, environments. Um, what we've run into a lot is a lot of the projects that we're involved with are either in historic districts, overlay, design overlay districts. There might be a planning over design overlay district. Uh, much of it's in um, business districts and several of them are in uh, places that folks are trying to create a destination out of their out of their uh, their downtown, um, you know. One thing in particular that I want to mention: a lot of our work is kind of at the intersection of infrastructure and amenity. So all this infrastructure and transportation stuff that that Sam was talking about, really, our work involves making sure that we get the most bang for the buck out of those projects in terms of, you know, positively affecting the quality of life for the citizens of of your town. Uh, and, and really taking advantage of that to create amenity, improve quality of uh, life, as well as to improve the economics of a place, you know, like, like Blackstone. Um, so, so that is a, is a primary uh, goal. Services that we offer are really soup to nuts. Anything from revitalization type planning, which might be funded through a CDBG type grant, uh, planning grant and or implementation. We're working on several implementation projects right now all the way through doing the design and engineering for a streetscape or a trail project or a downtown event park. Um, you know, we're leading two teams right now where we're doing um, uh, downtown parks as well as facade improvements, where we have an architect doing facade improvements through the CDBG program. So that's kind of an example. Can't really see this as really fuzzy, but um, a lot of our planning type projects we're involved with um, end with a very specific uh, uh, implementation plan which takes all the community priorities, the priority projects, and we try to match those up with available funding sources so that at least we know what's doable. We have a realistic plan for funding so we're not just at the end of the project saying, yeah, you, need, you all need to spend about $15 million on your downtown or whatever it might be. We look at the projects and team with folks like uh, the grant writers at Moffle and Nickel and, and Sam and other folks we know to make sure that we parse out how the projects are going to be implemented realistically based on, you know, the matching funds we can put together through the proffers and other things that Sam mentioned and other grants we leverage to get the projects uh, implemented. And as I mentioned, that could be anything from planning to facade renovations to streetscapes, parks, uh, or, or uh, safety uh, improvements. We're working on a project as a sub right now with the town of Warsaw. I believe they have a uh, stormwater grant through uh, DEQ, uh, and they're improving all their uh, stormwater infrastructure downtown and creating a, there's a big stormwater pond they're going to be putting in to handle the stormwater, but they're making that site into a, a park for their community that they can hold community events on and at the same time leverage in a CDBG grant to, to redo their, their downtown streetscape to tie into that space. So those are some examples. These are some just brief examples of sort of the kit of parts or the pieces of the puzzle from some examples of places we've been. Uh, an economic development plan for the uh, county of Bath. Uh, that's over in the western part of the state near Lake Muma, if you've ever been over there, Hot Springs, uh, Virginia, the homestead. You know, it's a pretty rural and poor area. The the 800-pound gorilla in the room is a homestead resort, and they kind of control, you know, a lot of, a lot of things. But uh, so the this project culminated in a demonstration project. What they asked me to do as part of it was to lead a community charrette where we looked at downtown Hot Springs. They had had trouble for years getting the homestead and some other groups in town together with the county management and the citizens to agree on what they were going to do with downtown homestead and what needed to be improved, what was the most important, and who was responsible for working on that. You know, for years there was an attitude of pointing the finger as the other guy was responsible for, for doing things. You know, it was the homestead that was responsible or Bath County. So the takeaway was 
we help facilitate the stakeholders to come to an agreement, you know, on, on how to move, how to move forward. Uh, you all might have been to Gordonsville at some point in the future. That's a little town uh, in Orange County, Virginia, small town. Um, so this is an example of some of the work we do. This is a historic district, uh, very uh, active business district. And our project there was to implement a streetscape project in the business district. And we accomplished several things, creating a gateway, really creating a better business environment, making sure they had parallel parking, access, accessible sidewalks, and an attractive environment to conduct, conduct their, their, their business. So we dealt with VDOT here, the railroad, as well as the town business owners to implement a very successful project. That was a, that was a TAP funded, what was then a transportation enhancement uh, grant project, an 80-20 match. Uh, another example of a project bigger scale, I don't know if you all have ever been to Danville, but um, Danville's trying to go, undergo an economic transformation over the last few years. They've, they've made a lot of progress in that. As you know, the, the mills left and tobacco industry has declined, so they're kind of left in a pickle. But they've done a really good job with uh, revitalize, revitalizing some of their main districts, the Main Street Business District, what they call the River District, which is all along the Dan River, as well as what they call their warehouse district is an area where all the tobacco warehouses were that they're redeveloping. This project was really a, uh, it, it, it met several objectives. It tied all those districts together visually and uh, spacious, spacious, uh, spatially and aesthetically. And the idea was really to create a gateway, but also help to improve the pedestrian connections in between all these districts and enhance that, again, that attractiveness of that downtown and business environment and to create a de destination. If you're familiar with the site, it's right between the two main bridges that come across the Dan River into the downtown area. It was an old parking lot and cut over road. So we filled that place in with, 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 that, uh, with that project. So those are just examples of from kind of bigger scale to implementation scale of kind of the pieces of the puzzle that, that we offer uh, to the team and to the town of uh, Blackstone. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> we spent a lot of time talking about, I think, some of the opportunities we have to help you with uh, funding opportunities. And the way I liken that is it's a lot of pieces, a lot of moving parts, a lot like sausage being made. Everybody likes it, but nobody wants to be a part of it. Well, the experience I've had over the years is knowing how to put all those pieces together and put it together to provide funding opportunities and help you go in the direction you want to be able to go. Um, beyond you know, getting funding, we're very prepared to actually do some work for you with, with the projects themselves. I want to touch a little bit on that. Um, I'm very familiar with the VDOT LAP manual. I did not put it together, but I was a part of the uh, implementation, if you will, in that being my office was close to Richmond, oftentimes we were asked to uh, guinea pig certain things. So a lot of what we focused on in, in the discussion prior to this is really the planning side of things. But I wanted to just touch on a few things that uh, leave you with the impression of our strengths with related to design and construction, as well as operations and maintenance. Um, one thing I think comes to mind here is uh, our approach to managing small projects. Um, I know managing a small project is a little different than a big project. Uh, oftentimes, and that, that graphic there is intended to show that you know seven small projects is worth the same dollar value as one big project. You don't manage them necessarily the same way. Um, probably the biggest important most part of that is to uh, clearly identify the purpose and need of the project. And that's something that we would be looking to you all in the town, primarily through the town manager, to develop that purpose and need. We would help you do that. And from that, we would develop a scope that then we would execute. And the way we would execute that to stay on time and on budget and to keep uh, costs down would be to provide continuous teamwork. You don't let people go off on their own and work independently on autopilot, but rather stay focused and together as a team. And a couple of examples of that where I've seen over the years where you start with a small project and if you're not careful, it just kind of grows on you. I use a turn lane as an example. You, we might be improving a turn lane at one of your intersections, but we're not there to uh, replace all of the pavement. We're not there to go chase all the hydraulic issues. We're not going to be having scope creep. We're going to stay focused on what the project in hand was. And if those things were identified up front as part of the scope, fine. But if not, 
we stay focused on the project. I'm aware of, the, of you guys having a very aggressive sidewalk improvement program throughout the town. Um, one of the things there is that when you get the money for, to do a sidewalk, you want as many linear feet of sidewalk as you can. You don't want to spend that money unnecessarily, say, on right-of-way or utilities. And I think of a utility all the time. I think of moving a pole. You know, one utility pole, even one you may own yourself, an electrical pole, could be $100,000 to move. So we have some innovative ways to go around those poles and still maintain ADA compliance for folks in wheelchairs and that sort of things. The point is we're not going to move a pole just for the sake of moving a pole. Stay focused on the intended scope of the project. Um, another example where I think we can bring some uh, uh, expertise here that will save time and money. Um, as we said earlier in the program, um, KDR is on our team for right-of-way acquisition. They're a good firm. I've worked with them myself for 20 years. But I've overseen right-of-way, too. I've overseen the right-of-way um, for 11 years when I was at VDOT Richmond District. And the important thing I bring from that is that right-of-way doesn't work alone. You, you integrate them with the designers. Uh, having an understanding of funding issues. For instance, revenue sharing wouldn't require federal requirements for, uh, um, uh, for right-of-way, like the uniform uh, code for uh, relocation. But uh, a federal project would. I also understand how you can accelerate things. I'll give you an example of that is that most of the time people take activities such as appraisals and title work and they include that in the right-of-way phase and so you lose time sometimes waiting for that right-of-way phase to get started. But anything prior to negotiations, if you budget it in the preliminary engineering phase, could actually give you an opportunity to accelerate a project. So as an opportunity to, to speed up a project, for instance. As I said earlier, not having people work in a vacuum. Designers putting a line on paper may not understand completely what that does to right-of-way and utilities. It may force the movement of a utility pole, as I said earlier. Another example I'm sure that, you, that resonates with you all with your constituents is everybody is very conscious of their setback requirements, right? So the difference between a right-of-way line and a permanent easement line could mean the difference in someone's ability to deal with their setback. Those are some other examples of how I've helped uh, localities before and citizens and businesses in those localities. I think the most important thing I've experienced, though, over the years about right-of-way is the best parcel is the one you don't have to touch. Don't want to touch it is the best thing. And so getting people together up front, getting those right-of-way experts together up front, along with the other experts, is how you make that happen. So to summarize, you kind of looking at all the different disciplines put together, working together with our leadership, you guys as the owner, with stakeholders such as VDOT and Fort Pickett and others, is to really identify and quantify risks up front. And we have the ex expertise to know what those risks are likely to be. The de get the decision makers involved early on. The town council is the ultimate decision makers. And from our perspective, that's through uh, the town manager. And that's where the decision making is, is made. But we can work together with the major stakeholders to get folks on board early. Um, I've had examples of, of where I've had to go, I know I need state approval for this or federal approval for that. So you get those people involved early on. You don't wait till the last minute to get them involved. It's about being proactive with project management and never assume anything. Stay focused, keep people together. So back to what you saw at the beginning. Why select Moffat and Nickel? I'd like to leave you with the impression today that I'm a knowledgeable project manager. I'm someone that knows Blackstone certainly not as well as you, but I've been here for most of my life, which does exceed 46 years, by the way. I've been here over 50 years. Um, I, I know the area. Uh, I come here uh, often. I, I, I tend to commute to Richmond to work, of course, but when I come weekends and stuff, I tend to come this way more often. Very knowledgeable. I know the local government through my experience in, in Dinwiddie County primarily. I know how transportation and land use affect one another. My experiences with VDOT and, and others allow me to navigate VDOT successfully for you and to be an advocate for your transfer, transportation needs. I feel like all those skill sets together allow me to have a rapport with your town manager and work together as a team to, uh, you know, to, to look for, um, uh, to be an advocate for your needs. And as we talked about earlier with our team, we certainly have a qualified team that can be as capable of, of your design, construction, oversight, and maintenance needs as well. So leaving you, you that, leaving you with the final graphic here, um, you saw this early on, 
and this is kind of how I liken this. This isn't high school, you know. It's, it's not. I'm not sitting over here in the right hand uh, seat um, uh, with a brake pedal. I'm not sitting to dry, trying to grab the wheel. You know, my, my analogy of this is the town's driving. Phillips the driver. He's driving that. And Moffat and Nickel is the GPS unit that's going to help guide you in the direction that you're driving and to help with you with your funding and planning, design, and construction needs. So Moffat and Nickel is really, I believe, your best end-to-end -end transportation management solution to assist you. And so with that, are any questions? If I may very quickly, between your downtown experience and perhaps experience you have with GRPT, like with BABS, um, transit, rail, more. rail. Um, the town of Blackstone, I believe, is in some need of additional parking for the downtown area. Are you familiar with downtown? We did a we we made an application for GHCD for the second half, the second phase of our downtown that we had, and we just turned it. So it was a good participation, but we probably need a little more robust effort uh, to do downtown. But I think we have a significant need for parking in the downtown area. Okay. As the town council is approving more and more apartment complexes on second floor of the building, yeah. we've got to take the pressure off the applicants because right. most cannot provide parking. Mm -hmm. Our ordinances require parking and create a constant uh, friction between the doing property owners and town council and for probably unpleasant public hearings. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, the guy next door has to come and speak about the apartment that he doesn't want using his parking spaces. Mm -hmm. and all so one of the things that we're going to try to do, I hope we can try to do, and I think council is endorsed, is try to find a solution to some more downtown parking. One of the solutions, I believe, is adjacent to the railroad tracks. Okay. Okay. And are there programs through GRPT downtown that we can do some improvement, do some acquisition, or negotiate long-term leases with, with uh, the railroad? I find the railroad such a monolith that you just can't. I need somebody who knows how to talk to the railroad guys, otherwise I'm going to get bounced from Norfolk or Atlanta back to the real estate division or in Indianapolis. That is something, can you, is that something you can help? You and I have talked about South Main Street, and we yeah. kind of have a phased approach of that, but does yeah. something like that work for you guys? Or can you do that? Yeah, yes. Um, a couple yeah. things come to mind. One is um, we have as a client DRPT, and we do a lot of work with them, and that's allowed us to build some very strong relationships with uh, railroads in Virginia and Norfolk Southern in particular. So we have some good experience there with uh, um, having some uh, uh, experience there dealing with the railroads uh, with the projects that we're working on with DRPT. As you mentioned, because of work, working with DRPT, we're very familiar with both the transit side as well as the rail side. The other thing that comes to mind, um, I used to over, the, the person who manages the uh, parking lot program at VDOT is a, a young lady that used to work for me. I know her very well. Most of her parking lot work is in the context of commuter parking lots and how it affect, how it applied for in smart scale. But the first thing that comes to mind is that there are mechanisms both with dealing with the railroad that we have experience with, dealing with DRPT, which we have experience with, and dealing with VDOT and smart scale and how it applies to parking lots. That is the, the first, my first blush, I think, is, is the attack that I would take to help you with, with addressing that. And Bill, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that or not. Yeah, it just reminds me of the parking study that was done in Danville. They ran it through our on-call. <coughs> there was a specialist consultant that was looking at downtown parking and the parking garages and things like that because one of the sites that's called the downtown and they wanted to convert potentially to a park. We even looked at options where it was a park and parking. At the same time, they decided they needed more parking. They needed the parking lot. Currently, it's a parking lot, but I was just curious if you all had done an analysis of the parking downtown in terms of your current inventory of parking, where it is, and then in a build-out scenario in terms of your zoning and your zoning requirements, how much parking is actually needed? Two space per residential, two spaces per okay. unit, and I would say there are no more than maybe ten currently occupied units in downtown Blackstone. I think the potential. Yeah. Up and down the street could be significant. And with FASI, we are struggling to find temporary and transient type housing. Okay. These folks aren't necessarily going to move here. Yeah. I don't think Darwin's going to be able to run with new subdivisions. I don't think Blackstone is either. But I can tell you, there's a lot of places where a lot of people are looking for extended stay um, type apartments and hotels and all those kinds of things. Because I think a lot of folks are going to stay in 
in FASI's environmental review or report that they prepared, admittedly says, most people live in Chesterfield, still in Amelia, more so than even Iowa County. So, with so respect to DRPT, we, Sam mentioned, we are uh, working with them. We're actually working with them on a Husky Rail project as well, originally to uh, DC. But they, uh, uh, we've got a planning contract with them as well, where we, it's two years ago, we helped them update their benefit cost analysis method, which is similar to what he's talking about with Smart Scale that they use for the Rail Enhancement Fund grant application process. So it's the same idea where you have to show um, what's your benefit and, and if you've got similar parameters that they look at uh, of a project versus what's the cost that you're asking them to put in. I can't even say I'm looking for funding. Yeah. I'm just saying, God, can you real, get through this thing and, yeah, and find a way for the real estate end of it through the railroad and if DRPT can participate or your connections to them yeah. and at least bring the railroad to the table to fix it. I mean, some, well, and, and that's the thing with, the, with, yeah. the, uh, with the class one railroads, CSX and Norfolk Southern, they're in the business to move freight. They really don't have a whole lot of vested interest in, in other amenities outside of that. Um, no, but, but we do have some connections with both, both of those railroads. Um, um, we can move the work we can do with the RPG. Our smart scale application number two, does it have I think so. As I mentioned to you in the presentation, I think there are ways to, to beef up the score. 30 and 35 percent were safety and um, congestion. I'm sorry, and economic development. But two other factors in there, you guys scored a zero in those areas, and so you don't want to leave anything with a zero. And I think if, when I at first blush, I would focus on safety and, and uh, economic development. But as I also mentioned in the presentation, and I think um, uh, I know I've talked to you in the past about this when I was at VDOT, is that a lot of times you have to take a sort of an incremental approach to things. One of the things that hurts a lot of smart scale projects is the sheer cost of it. And if you don't have any funding to offset the funding request, then the other way to skin that cat is to do an incremental approach. And I don't think, I know you don't want to leave folks with the impression you're going to do something and that's it, that you're just putting a Band-Aid on it. But the method that I propose is one where you're going to show prog continuous progress and show a plan of how to get from where you want, where you are now to where you want to be with incremental projects that are much more likely to get funded. Uh, you know Carlos Brown? Yes. You know him when? No, no, but I know him. Okay. And, and what I said earlier, I alluded to this, one of the things that if you haven't done already is we need to get Carlos Brown out here. Does, is Carlos Brown doesn't even know where Blackstone is. He's been. Yeah. Believe it or not, I got Next. down here last year. I can't reach him this year. He's not responsible. Well, I've, I've worked with other localities at VDOT, and the, the advice I've given them over the years is be persistent and also to know these players. Mm -hmm. So for you to identify that, I think, is right on the money. And so particularly with a TAP grant because, or even a smart scale. I said earlier you had a 1.5, and the, and the scores that got funding were 4.5s typically. Well, the board doesn't have to follow that. And so the way you get more... Um, uh, strength with your, is to get your board member out. And also, in addition to Carlos Brown, there are two at-large rural members. Um, yeah. Back in the day when Bob Quick was a, a at-large at rural member here, Blackstone got a lot of stuff. And so he lived here. Now, the two at-large rural members today don't live here, but they do represent the rural areas. So between Carlos Brown and the two at-large rurals, to get them involved. You know all three of them. I've met Carlos Brown. I don't know him that well. I, I retired about the same time he came. So you know Carlos Brown is the Richmond District Rural? Not rural, just the district. Richmond District representative who represents our yes. market. He'd take Bob Quick's place, so to speak? Well, now, Bob Quick was on it back in the 70s and 80s. Yes. And so Bob Quick was actually, um, I think he, at, at some points, he was actually the district representative, and he was also an at-large rural. But the point I wanted to make uh, to Philip was that it's not just Carlos Brown, but we want to get the uh, at-large rural ones act, um, acclimated to the town as well. Can you do that as well? You make those contacts. I've done it for years. I'm very familiar with it. Um, sidewalk planning. It's all here. I'm going to write it down. Can you do that? Um, we applied for uh, revenue sharing money. I, I've got that application too. You had that application. It got smoked. And uh, instead of it being in my head and floating around and people questioning why I spend money on things, does it make sense? And I, I feel it makes sense to have a long term 20 year plan on what we're going to do and how are we going to 
connect amenities and all that kind of thing. Um, is revenue sharing the right place to go for that money? It's one of several tools that we should work together on. TAP, revenue sharing, safe routes to school, possibly smart scale, possibly some other things. But together, we can approach that plan because the point I was trying to make here with the South Main Street example, um, and it is hard to see, but hopefully it'll re it's reflective in the, what is in your uh, folders, proactive funding management. Philip, what you're asking is talking about how to fund a program and how to keep it, uh, how to keep it in, things in the pipeline, and how to keep things moving, show progress for the constituents, and yes, it's all of the above. It's applying for all the different grants and integrating them together. Sidewalk and newer concept is no good, and even the common guy in town says, well, "We want to try to figure out a plan so we can post it somewhere." I would like to on the town's website and in the hallway, where people can say, "Oh, I'm in year four, I'm in year seven, I'm." I mean, the funding is one thing, but the plan is something else, and uh, so many people can see where they're at. We're putting together a plan right mm -hmm. now for kind of Alta Vista, EPR, mm -hmm. and us are putting that together. There's and, a very and, similar plan. And maybe boring everybody, but the, the different things that have come up over the years, we also have a group in town that would like very much to have some bike lanes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't know how to do right bike and bike. Mm -hmm. but, uh, my kids do. And what are some ideas that we could uh, do some things like that? Are there funds available for... For, for alternatives like that, I don't know, for chat projects or whatever, but there are a series of, and I think, probably shouldn't call them soft projects, but they're not necessarily the hard widening the street or, you know, they are putting in a retaining wall or a head wall. I mean, it's a little more of a planning nature, and um, I think it would make some sense for us to have some planning done. Just as DHCD is recommending us to have a town-wide housing plan, mm -hmm. area one, area two, area three, so once we finish one, then there you come, this is number three. Do the same thing with curb and gutter drainage, all those kind of things. Um, I think there's parts of town or ordinances now require people to pay half for curb and gutter. Um, I think there's a parts of town where people are resistant to that. Low income neighborhoods. Are, you want me to contribute three thousand bucks to this thing? What are you talking about? Now I'm trying to explain liens and and uh, title uh, blemishes. And, yeah, it's just not good. So uh, if we can find funds to serve more of these low income neighborhoods. I think the plan you describe is one where it's going to require different funding sources, probably different construction sources, like proffers may do some of it, and you need to connect the dots, for instance. But it's all about having a program and a plan to do it. When he says proffer, he's trying to get y'all killed. <laughs> That's a good way for y'all to get killed. <laughs> we don't do proper, we don't do cash proper. We do some uh, uh, conditional rezoning periodically right. uh, that may have some dedication to right away and things right. like that. But we, we're, we're pretty. Well, the General Assembly killed the cash proper, so. Is it? Dead? It's yeah. pretty effectively dead. Yeah, has a noose around anybody's neck and no good. It's a bribery scheme. Right. Can I say anything else? No, when very good presentation. We appreciate your comment. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I just thought of something. Were you on the bridge that day that I had that big meltdown about Hong Kong? No, okay, no. Uh, I think you and I talked about this one time before. No, I, I wasn't there, but. Uh. <laughs> That's uh, how we got your fence put up, Barbara, and you were uh, sidewalked over the bridge. Barbara lives okay. just across the bridge, okay. mm -hmm. and I think there were some last minute understandings that the certain. Uh, some of the sidewalk wasn't going to be replaced, and the fence was just going to, the contractor said, well, I'm just going to come along and bend it at that. <laughs> so, uh, we offered to pay for the sidewalk, and then I think the timing, I think Bob was worried it wasn't really done in time. It was well, a little meltdown. Well, if I may, I think I'll use that as an example of something I think I can help you with in the future. VDOT is a big organization. It's got 22 localities just in Richmond District. It's only so much of them to go around. It's hard for them to be all things to everybody. And I think someone like myself that has the VDOT experience can help you and assist you in providing what your constituents need. The reason need. I bring this up is the role that I would anticipate you guys filling somewhat mm -hmm. would be a role that the town needs Jack Hodge for. for mm -hmm. That's really not a successful model. I don't think it works with the staff at VDOT. It doesn't work with me. Yeah. And we don't... Just so you know, 
you know, and I don't think you're that guy. We don't need an eighth council person. We don't need a second town manager or another county administrator. We're looking for somebody who can sit back with VDOT and sit back and say, hey guys, this is the project, the town would like these things to happen. How do we get to those things to happen? And come along to bend that fence post or not. It's one of those things. Yeah, I think one of the things we, we try to point out, if you on that slide or not, but mm -hmm. you know, we're, you guys are the drivers of this, of this program. We're here to help you navigate and get through all the every steps of it to, to deliver a sexual process to the project and keep your constituents happy. I'm like you on that, Philip. I, I worked at VDOT under Jack Hodge. He was a very um, strong-willed person. Um, my father and him worked together. I, I had a good relationship with him. When he came to work here at Blackstone, uh, I know what you're talking about, and that's why I said here that I'm not over here trying to grab the wheel. If somebody needs to be caught, I guess I can do it. I don't need that. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. The role of the jack was. It was really tough. And um, we adhered to Jack, and he did some good work with it. Uh, but it, it, it got to be really tough management. Well, I promise to leave my politics at the county line. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for coming. So you heard about that, huh? Yeah. Heard about what? Yeah. The, uh, the bridge. Yeah. No, I remember that at the time. I remember. I heard about that from multiple sources, including you. Yeah. Bye, y'all. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you so much okay. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate Enjoy it. the yes, presentation. Good. You may want to hear this. You know, the guys that came and left here earlier, they do transportation, but they are 59 out of 72. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. But they're creating water and sewer. Yeah. Do y'all do water and sewer? We do a little bit of water and sewer water. work. Um, it's not our, our um, forte by any means, but, but it's more in line with what we would do with a transportation project. So it's going to be more of the, the linear work, not the, not the treatment plants and that kind of stuff. Was the older gentleman back? I haven't <laughs> spoken to him in 20 years. I wasn't sure. Hank Bug, uh, I sat on the interviews when he was first hired in 1997, oh, wow. sitting at this table right here. Uh, the town had been a matter in Craig. Yeah. I don't even know yeah. if they're still around. They're, they're still around. They're still around. Sam McGee, I think, was the name of the guy. Okay. The town had been a matter in Craig and a wide welcome in town for yeah, so 50 years. My father was on the town council in McKinney when I was in college. Uh, Dr. Bug was doing the water and sewer in McKinney because my dad had a big program very similar to what you spoke of. I wanted to give, he, wanted, he didn't want any more outhouses in the town of McKinney. He wanted everybody on public sewer, water and sewer. And he went and got grants and, and then got these grants and, and BNB was doing the work. And, uh, because I was a college engineering student, he asked me to check Mr. Bud's work. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> How did you go to school at Blackstone, living in the dogs? Um, I went to Blackstone Day School. Oh, okay. And then I went to Dinwiddie High School. And uh, went to went on to Virginia Military Institute after that. Where are you live in dogs? Um, you go uh, anywhere Sharon Baptist Church is. Sure. All right, go on past there a little ways. You know where Whitmore Road, Manson Church Road is? Uh -huh. Just take a left on Manson Church Road, and I have a farm. Okay. Uh, you know where Manson yeah. Church itself is? Sure. My farm is pretty much all around Manson's Church. I have I have that farm in there adjacent to the Manson Church property. Okay. So that's 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 my farm in there. Well, you must know uh, Spencer Wallace. Spencer he's Wallace. The, he's did, the mayor down there. Spencer Wallace <laughs> built my my road. I have about a half mile road up to the house. Uh huh. And Spencer Wallace was the one that uh, graded and built my road. Oh, years damn ago. Well, I'm I'm <laughs> friends with him and his wife, and I don't know whether you know Phyllis Golden or not. Oh yeah, another yeah. Golden. Th family. Those are my friends. Yeah. But Spencer, you know, had a lot of brothers that most of which oh, passed yeah. on. Yeah. And uh, uh, one of which uh, worked with my dad at VDOT, another one ran our local store there in town mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, very, the you know, Wallace is over in Cambridge related to him. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. there's a lot, a lot of folks like that. Yeah, he calls he calls himself the mayor down there. <laughs> well, I'm out in the suburbs. See, I, I can't, Darbles is too crowded for me, so I live out in, in what's called the Tri City area, uh -huh. Baltimore Corner, Flat Rock, Darbles. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Ford address. Wait someplace in my, where we live. Probably a mile through the woods. Well, Ford address, but we're in the meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
The biggest thing about Darvel as it relates to this is I can be here in a few minutes and help you with any questions you might have and any 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 opportunity you may need. Okay. Including town council meetings. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, like I said, you I, mentioned those. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I've spoken. The last time I've spoken here was on uh, the Church Street intersection at uh, Road 40. Remember the Crawley family lost a little bit of their property there at the corner. Yeah, that was what I was here speaking. Thank you. Well, yeah. thank y'all. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was mine. That's yours, but I bought yeah. mine. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get some. I ain't got far to go to you. I'm going to go to sleep. Oh, me too. That guy sounded like he had quite a pedigree, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what was his name? The one? Sam Hayes. Sam Hayes. I can tell uh, Spencer that I met Sam Hayes. Sam Hayes. Sam Hayes. Mm. Yeah, that man, Massive Church. Mm-hmm. Sharon Baptist. No, Sharon is right on 40. Madison is down there to the left, wrong down. And uh, on the back side of McKay. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's Spencer, he tells everybody he's the um, mayor down there. And, Spencer's uh, a good boy. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm the queen in Blackstock. <laughs> 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 oh, hey, Lord. Huh? Not but one. Not but one. Oh, they're rolling in here. Hello. I was in giving some stuff with him earlier today. Hello. Oh, How are you? How are you? We are fine. Good. All right. Come on in the house. Very mm -hmm. fine. And very glad to be here. Hello. Hello. Glad to have you. Hi. All right. Okay. Where would you like this to be? This is all yours. I, I do ask, uh, and if you didn't know this, you're being recorded. As we speak, and your interview will be recorded and posted on the town council website as part of our transparency efforts. Okay. And uh, the recording is on, and we're in open session of a um, police and employment committee meeting. Wade Hamner is on the uh, committee. Hello, sir. How are and you? Is a member of town council. Uh, Alfred Tucker mm -hmm. is a member of town council and a member of the okay. police and employment committee. Mm -hmm. And Barbara Thompson is in the center. She's the president of council, which is like mm -hmm. a big vice mayor. Okay. And no. she is also the chairman, chairperson of our police and employment committee. Okay. And they've been tasked with interviewing engineers for general engineering services agreement. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> Or we can just put off next time. We'll have another meeting. Thompson, it's all you. No, we're going. Let's get it over with. Yeah. Okay. It's all you, good. Okay, I'm good. Glad to have y'all. There you are, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken? My face didn't match for it. I have two. You got hers? Yeah. Okay. Good deal. I need one for Phil. Yeah. Phil. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where'd he go? He'll be back. He'll be back, He'll be back in a minute. Where is he sitting? He's out there. Oh, he's he's going to be out here. there somewhere. Uh -huh. He's going to sit out there. Fine, thank you. How are you? Y'all, you, you set up? Uh, Y'all ready okay. to roll? We we'll wait for them to come back in here. We we can wait for them. We're okay. We're ready to. Uh, we are ready to go. Okay. Just wait a few minutes for them to come. Well, here he comes Phil. Hmm. And Wade should be back in a minute. Well, you said you had a basketball game there too tonight. Yeah, I gotta go to football. My kids are. They play for Kenton. Yeah, you know me. I used to appreciate it. Go to people or something. I appreciate it. I know Sharon. You guys are out of the Lynchburg office? We are. Okay. 
Do you work at Lynchburg or Farmville? I live in Farmville mm -hmm. and um, work, I only work part time. I work part time at home. Okay. But you're a son of a Lynchburg, yeah. okay. I'll give you all a real quick rundown while we're waiting on everybody to get hydrated and run the bathroom. The, uh, the town of Blackstone has a general engineering services contract typically, and it has expired. Mm -hmm. okay? And b and was the engineer. Their, their contract has expired, and so we're interviewing again for general engineering services. It can be one engineer, it can be two engineers, it can be ten engineers. We don't have a specific, and it can all be, you know, Mac is excellent with the wastewater treatment mm -hmm. plants and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. water chemistry and mm -hmm. all those kind of things, mm -hmm. and water upgrades at the treatment plant, all those mm -hmm. kind of things. And I think they even use you guys sometimes for material testing or Lynchburg or whatever. Um, so we may hire three engineers, we may hire two engineers, we may hire one engineer, but uh, we're going to try to attach engineers to the expertise. You know, obviously Mac is really oh. good at the treatment plant. Um, that was good timing on my part, wasn't it? I said it was good timing and got back the same time you did. Yeah. <laughs> so it is open competition, and um, so it's, uh, it's not Max to, to lose. And uh, we're going to find out where are the different things that you did that were really great at. And you dressed up at these committees, and, but mm -hmm. it's not going to be necessarily just one hire to do something for anybody. And the interview three, and you're going to ask that. That's right. All right. Wade Hamner again, town council, Alfred Tucker, town council, mm -hmm. Barbara Townsend, and the president of council, and chairman of the committee. All right. All right. Thank you all for inviting us to be here. My name's Earl Dickerson. Okay. I'm uh, chairman of the board of Public Profit. Fred Warner behind me is one of our engineers. He directs our engineering group. In the proposal that we sent you, Mike Wilson was identified as the single point of contact, and he still will be. Mike had a fall and fell out of the tree, not out of the tree stand, but trying to get into the tree stand it, during the uh, hunting season, and has a problem with his knee. Mm. And it makes it a little difficult for him to get around, so Trent said, I'll be glad to sub and take his place. Sharon Carney is our grant writing administration expert. And she's got a lot of information, a lot of wealth of information, and it's all in your proposal that we sent to you all back whenever proposal day was due. I don't remember the exact date. But we're here to tell you all what we believe are the things that we're good at, which are the things on this board, which is the same thing I handed you all in that laminated sheet. Okay. And we provide all these services in-house. We don't, we don't go out and get sub-consultants and, and those type things for what we do based on what we understand, we believe your needs would be as a town relative to transportation services because the RFP starts out focusing on transportation and then it speaks about general engineering services beyond that. The general engineering or public works would be the right side of that sheet that I gave you, and the transportation would be the left side. Now, we can go through and talk about every one of these items, which we might be here longer than you'd want to be in terms of uh, the evening, and we understand people got other things to do, and listen, engineers talk and talk. We believe for public works and transportation projects, for them to be successful, no matter what the locality and who it is, that first item, grant writing and funding assistance, we believe are the two items that make a project successful or the project doesn't get off the ground because you don't have the funds to be able to do it. And to help you all as a town do that is Sharon. Now, I'm not going to tell about your experience. That's for you to do. And that's for you to talk about. So enough of me. <laughs> um, well, I, I've known Phyllis when um, I, I worked as the economic development for Prince Edward County for 12 years. And prior to that, I was a projects manager for the city of Danville for 10 years. And my primary goal there was to take a entire part of the city and do revitalization efforts 
on historic structures, find the funding, build the project, you know, close the grants out, um, and did that in a number of different areas of the city of Danville. The most successful was 10 years and $15 million for a project called the Crossing of the Dam. If you've been there, it's an old train station and a science museum. Uh, 10 years of my life went into that. And, um, but um, what, I, what I do now for Hurt and Profit is really is when you come up with ideas or I, I would like to do this and I'd like to do that, is to help you research the best way to fund it, find money for you, how to leverage one financial asset to another financial asset so that it's the least amount of um, financial burden on your community. And even in general services, I met Earl because in Prince Edward County, I called him up all the time and said, Earl, I, I want to write a grant, but I need another dollar amount. <coughs> and over the years, I just picked up the phone and called him over and over and over again because Prince Edward had him as a general services engineer. And so I just used him as a resource and, and then put it into the grant. The very first thing you have to do is put your budget together. And so um, that's not everybody has an Earl on, on hand. So it's like, well, maybe we can help you um, provide that service for you. So I'm not an engineer, but they're engineers and everything that you do will involve engineering somehow. And so if you want to um, reduce the financial burden on whatever project you want to do, um, and I've done just about every grant out there that the state and a lot that the federal offers, and we've been very successful at it. So uh, I think we, it's a good service that a lot of engineering companies don't have, and a lot of small communities can't afford to hire at a full-time person to do this. So. Mm -hmm.